Welcome to the Ezra Levant Show. I'm Ezra Levant. We've got an exciting show for you today. A former U.S. ambassador to Canada blasting President Barack Obama's decision to kill the Keystone XL pipeline and keep importing OPEC crude oil to America instead. And we've got an exclusive interview with Joe Oliver, the finance minister under Stephen Harper's Conservatives. We'll talk with him about the election, Justin Trudeau's new cabinet, and his thoughts for rebuilding the conservative movement. That's all coming up in a moment, but first, on the occasion of our debut show, permit me to take a moment to talk about who we are and what we're doing. First off, we're broadcasting from our world headquarters. Now, don't laugh when I say world headquarters because it actually is. Unlike, say, my show at the Sun News Network or any other show on regular TV, see, on regular TV, you're limited by geography and by which cable companies agree to carry your channel. And of course, everything is under the thumb of bureaucrats and politicians at the government CRTC and the broadcast standards censors. Here at the Rebel.media, we're much more free. And anyone with an internet connection or even a smartphone can get our show. And since we launched back in February, nearly four million different people have come to our website around Canada, and 13% of our viewers are from other countries too. We have a much larger audience now than we did back at Sun News. And on some days, we even have a bigger audience than CTV or CBC. They're all news cable channels. One day last month, we had more than 180,000 people come to our website. What's new today is that we're in our gorgeous new studio that was 100% funded by our viewers. Thank you. We're truly a grassroots network, and it's all because of you. We started barely eight months ago with our first video literally filmed in my living room. It makes me laugh to think about that, but that's how you do it as a startup. We've come a long way since then, producing more than 1,800 short videos that have collectively been watched 14 million times. Well, today, as you can see, we're starting something new, a daily TV-style show. We're going to keep producing those short videos for sure, but we're adding to The Rebel with longer-form TV, daily shows from here in our studio. We gave you a glimpse of our studio on election night. Literally days after we finished construction on the set, it was an amazing success, our la largest audience until that point in time, and now we're ready to do it every day. In addition to my show, we hope to bring in other shows, including some weekly specials. Later this week, we've got an exciting announcement about a new TV star who's joining our little network. You're going to love it. It's my hope to grow our network, improving our quality and quantity, slowly but surely, always listening to you, our viewers, and always living up to our mandate to provide the other side of the story and to do so fearlessly. For the next few months, these new shows will be available for free on our website, therebel.media. But eventually, we're going to put them in a members-only area for $8 a month, the way Netflix does it, but for less than Netflix. That will give us a business model that will allow us to keep growing while people continue to abandon the media party en masse. Thanks for joining us. I hope this show becomes part of your daily routine. Come back in a moment for my thoughts on the risky plan by Justin Trudeau's liberals to bring in tens of thousands of unvetted Muslim migrants from Syria. You won't believe the latest on that. That's next on The Ezra Levant Show. Why should others go to jail Why? when you're a biggest carbon Thank consumer you. I know? There's 8,500 customers here, and you won't give them an answer. You come here once a year with a sign, and you feel morally superior. The only thing I have to say to the government about why I publish it is because it's my bloody right to do so. One million Muslim men have flooded into Europe this year, all of them completely unvetted. They just arrive on foot, by train, by boat, whatever, and they are not stopped. Europe has borders, but they are as meaningless as a line on a map. So no armies have been mustered to stop this invasion of a million military-aged men from foreign countries. It's just amazing to watch. Do you see any women or children amongst them? Some media and politicians call them Syrian refugees as a way of generating sympathy. But according to the United Nations itself, three quarters of these migrants are men, pretty much the opposite of the Western conception 
of refugees being women and children or perhaps senior citizens. And the UN also acknowledges that the vast majority of migrants aren't Syrian either. It's basically anyone who can get to Europe from anywhere in the world, Syria, Iran, Afghanistan, Somalia, North Africa, whatever. The chief characteristic of all of them, though, is that they're young Muslim men coming from countries that are, at best, dictatorships, at worst, hotbeds of Muslim extremism and terrorism, and they are coming in completely unvetted. The Islamic State terrorist group announced its plans to invade Europe, embedding their terrorists amongst migrant men. They actually announced this, and yet Europe has not guarded its borders. Here's an Al-Qaeda terrorist who smuggled himself into Europe and was caught. But this terrorist, Mehdi Ben Nasser, was caught only because he was already caught once before and convicted and sentenced to jail. There were files on him, and somehow he was identified this time, but what about hundreds, maybe thousands of other jihadists who haven't been caught yet, who are sleeper cells, and so they're not already in European police computers? And then there's young Muslim men who aren't terrorists by the normal definition of that word. They're just Muslim extremists. They hate Jews, they hate gays, they hate the West, they hate liberal democracy and want Sharia law instead. You can't really call them terrorists. They just don't like Western civilization. I mean, if you poured 800,000 young men of any background into Germany, you'd have problems. But if those young men come from sexually repressed, misogynistic countries like those in the Muslim world, who believe that any woman who doesn't cover herself up can legitimately be raped, well, it's no surprise that rape is skyrocketing in Germany, that Sweden now has the highest rate of rapes in the world, Sweden. As I mentioned last week, 31% of Syrian refugees in actual refugee camps in Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon told an Arab pollster that they support the Islamic State. Again, these aren't terrorists, they're just people who cheer for terrorists, 31% of Syrian refugees. And now Justin Trudeau's liberals are going to bring tens of thousands of those Muslim men here to Canada. Now, during the election campaign, Stephen Hopper said he'd bring in 25,000 refugees too. He used the word refugees as in bringing the lambs over, not the wolves, the victims, not the perpetrators of violence. The media party and the liberals denounced that distinction as anti-Muslim racism, because of course if you're bringing over the victims, you're probably bringing over Christian Arabs who are being ethnically cleansed by Muslim extremists. You'd be focused on groups like the Yazidis or the Kurds. You'd have women, not just men. You'd be very cautious about bringing people over who are affiliated with groups who are doing the murdering. You'd probably be skeptical of a single military-age male claiming to be a refugee. You'd try to weed out Muslim extremists, but that's Islamophobia to the liberals and the media. They don't believe you should distinguish between the lambs and the wolves. That's discrimination, you see. Not only did Stephen Harper have a bias towards refugees, he also said national security was very important, and all refugees had to be carefully vetted. But Trudeau swore he'd bring in 25,000 Muslims by Christmas. I love that Christmas part, as if Muslim extremists celebrate a Christian holiday about Jesus. Well, Christmas is just six weeks away or so, and 4,000 men a week would have to be vetted to meet the deadline. How on earth can you possibly do a background check on 4,000 men a week in Arabic? in a place that doesn't have the same kind of documentation or records as we have here in Canada. I mean, the Liberal Party is the party that doesn't believe you even need to show photo ID to vote. They don't believe you even have to take off your face-obscuring Muslim mask called a niqab. So it's not just an absurd promise. It's a dangerous promise. Well, here we are three weeks after the election, and Trudeau has said he actually intends to go through with it. And he appointed John McCallum and old Jean Chrétien hack to lead up a cabinet subcommittee to make it happen. Here, listen to McCallum. It's incredible what he told journalists yesterday. Let me play you an extended clip. The government is committed to uh, welcome these uh, 25,000 refugees uh, by the end of the year, but we are also determined to do the job well, which means proper consideration be given to uh, security concerns and to health concerns. And to that end, I am very pleased today to announce the formation of a subcommittee of cabinet whose job it will be to carry out this mission that I have described. Obviously, a good number will be coming in the weeks to come. I cannot give you a precise number, 
but as we speak, we are working on transport, uh, air transport, uh, possibly uh, transport uh, by sea. We have to, we are working on the process uh, for selecting the refugees, for getting exit permits for these refugees. We have to engage in coming days with the uh, leaders of the countries in which the refugees are now residing with uh, transportation facilities with uh, the army is playing a major role because military bases could be one of the locations in which uh, these people are lodged. So we are working on all these fronts at the same time and within a short time, a matter of days or uh, a small number of weeks, we will have a detailed announcement of plans with numbers to provide to Canadians. So it's really happening. They are really going to take in 25,000 migrants in six weeks. And they haven't even started yet. They don't even know what country these migrants are going to be coming from or how they'll get here or how they'll vet them. No clue. Uh, McCallum says they might have plans ready in days or even weeks. So they won't even start this thing until it's almost December. But they know one thing. They're going to take tens of thousands of migrants no matter what. There's another thing. Did you catch it? It's actually huge. It's a bombshell. They are going to bring people over here before they are vetted. They're going to start moving people into Canada before they check them for health issues. Now, that's the easiest thing to check for tuberculosis, say, and it's a, it's a medical test. But what about psychological problems, post-traumatic stress disorder from living in a terrorist war zone? How do you test for that? In Arabic, 25,000 men, while you're putting them on boats and planes? Are we going to kick Canadians out of line for help for that? So the hundreds of Canadian military vets who can't get help fast enough for their PTSD, they'll have to wait in line a little longer because some unvetted Muslim extremists that we just scooped up from some backward Syrian village, well, Justin Trudeau says they're more important. John McCallum said we will actually take people before they are vetted. So they're coming over in the next six or seven weeks, ready or not. Why? Why couldn't we wait another month, another three months? Why on earth would we do this on an artificial deadline when such dangerous risks are at work? Health issues, that's the least of it. Security and terrorism issues, extremism issues. And even using our common sense, if there were hundreds of thousands, even millions of genuine refugees out there, and if we are dead set on taking tens of thousands, then fine. Well, why don't we take the tens of thousands who have the best chance of succeeding in Canada? Maybe they speak English or French. They're literate. They have job skills. Maybe they have family here who are can help them get going. Maybe they're actually Democrats and liberals. Why would we rush artificially to jam in 25,000 people just to rush? It makes no sense. But the last thing that McCallum said was surely the worst. Take a listen. The Army is playing a major role because military bases could be one of the locations in which uh, these people are lodged. So you're going to bring 25,000 Syrians over, unvetted, unchecked for communicable diseases, unchecked for extremism or Islamist views, and you are going to put them in on military bases. So people who haven't been screened for terrorism, you're going to put them in our military bases. Potential terrorists, now I presume they're not going to be kept in jail cells, they'll be kept on what, cots and tents? I don't know. And McCallum clearly doesn't either. Who knows? Maybe Canadian military families will be told to sleep on cots and the Syrian men will get the comfy beds, I don't know, but you're going to take people you acknowledge, at least implicitly, are a security risk, and you're going to put them where our guns and explosives are. You're going to put them where our military men and women are, our targets are. Are you insane? And if you find that they're a risk, a health risk, a security risk, once they're over here, then what? Will you just ship them back? How likely is that, given our terrorist-loving courts? the courts and the media who have turned Omar Khadr into a folk hero. Do you even doubt that as soon as these unvetted Syrians touch down on the ground, that pro-terrorist lawyers will immediately launch lawsuits against the Canadian government to bust them out of their custody, to release them into the general society, never to be deported? Do you really doubt that's going to happen? Our left-wing courts specialize in giving made-up charter rights to foreign citizens. It was our disgraceful federal court of appeal that gave a foreign woman the charter right to wear a niqab in our Canadian citizenship court. Do you doubt for a second that any Syrian man, even with a communicable disease or a terrorist risk, 
would immediately be sprung into, into society like they do in Germany? And do you doubt that that is actually what the liberals want to happen, just like it's happening en masse in Europe? Stay with us. More of the Ezra Levant Show to come. So open-minded that the brains have fallen out. What's the point that you're making? The point that I'm making is that if you're going to propose a massive overhaul to the way the economy is, is developed in terms of carbon tax, cap and trade, other forms like that, it helps to have some science that is in fact settled. Canadians from all across this great country sent a clear message tonight. It's time for a change in this country, my friends. A real change. Oh my God, it's come true. Justin Trudeau is the Prime Minister. I fear for our country. I'm not saying that just as a, an old conservative lover myself. I think that you know it, we have made a risky decision, but that's the decision of the voters. Joe Oliver, former Minister of Finance, thank you for joining us. At Happy the end of the day, congratulations to you on the, uh, the start of the, your new venture. Thank you very much. I tell you, it couldn't come soon enough. I think that the media party was the true winner in this election. The media, their love affair with the Liberal Party, you, you couldn't even see where the Liberals ended and the Liberals began. I think we need some opposition. You're not going to be in opposition because in your riding, that red wave, it swamped, it swamped the city of Toronto, didn't it? Yes, it did. It swamped the city of Toronto, uh, Vancouver and Montreal. Uh, there was clearly a desire for change. You know, I think we ran a very good government. I think it was a government that provided benefits to Canadians and made the, the economy more secure. But there was a desire for change and it manifested itself in some critical strategic voting. If the NDP had held on to the same votes as last time and the Greens, uh, the result in my riding would have been different and my riding was in fact a microcosm of the country. Isn't that the truth? I mean, in a way, Justin Trudeau achieved partially what Stephen Harper did about 10 years ago. He united the left. I mean, in, in your riding, you had a marquee candidate mm -hmm. for the NDP, former provincial finance minister, right. and his vote went down, actually went down. I mean, he had a star NDP or got less. I, I think that's really what happened. I mean, I think that's part of the story, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. In fact, his, his, his vote went from 12% to 6%. Huh. And that and the, the decline in the green would have, was all, I, was all I needed. But what, what's interesting, of course, is, is why that happened. And I think primarily it was the result of strategic voting. Those who wanted a change, you know, were taking the anti-conservative uh, message to heart, mm -hmm. um, decided to move with the Liberals once the NDP had started uh, to fall. The other reason, perhaps, and we don't know how much of a factor that was, is that the, the Liberals themselves had moved uh, to the left, clearly, you know, the tax on high-income people and, and some of their other measures, uh, deficit spending and so on, while uh, the, the, the NDP had moved a little bit more uh, to the center, I should say, uh, because they tasted power. Mm. And one example of that was, and I was a bit dubious of, that they would achieve it, was that they were in favor of a balanced budget, something you wouldn't normally have expected from the NDP. Hmm. Now, you were finance minister before that. You were natural resources minister. I'm going to ask you a little bit about that in a moment. But let's talk about your successor as finance minister. On paper, Bill Morneau looks like a pretty qualified guy. MBA, he's built a business up, he's grown, he's an entrepreneur. Give me let me be positive for a moment. Give me the, the positive qualities, the hopes that we can have that maybe you've got a grown-up in that important portfolio. What's the best thing you can say about your successor? Well, I think he's qualified for the job. Um, he, he's got a solid background in, in business. He's, he's been successful. Uh, I, I happened to, to meet him once in a debate uh, during, uh, during the election. Uh, you know, he's well-spoken. I think he, he can handle a job. What he doesn't have uh, yet is any political experience, and uh, he's, going to, um, he, he's going to be uh, in a, a pretty intense environment uh, from uh, the first, uh, first day on, and I'm sure he's spending a great deal of his time working through his, uh, his uh, massive uh, briefing papers. I know what that is. People said to me, 
I guess you're uh, drinking water from a fire hose. Well, that's uh, where he's at right now. And, uh, um, you know, we, uh, we always put country before party, and I wish him well. Well, I hope he reaches out to you for advice, because I think you, the way you're talking about him, I think you would give him nonpartisan advice from one finance minister to another. I think that whatever his qualifications and however open-minded he is, and whatever sensibility he may have from a life of actually building wealth and prosperity, he's not the boss. The boss is the prime minister, and the deputy boss is Gerald Butts, Justin Trudeau's uh, principal advisor on, on, on various matters. And let me give you an example of why I'm nervous about that. If Bill Moore knows the final word on taxes and debt, I'd feel confident enough, because frankly, on paper, he could be a Tory. But you've got Justin Trudeau, who's never run a business, never run anything, never had to earn money, he was a trust fund kid from when he was born. And the principal advisor, Gerald Butts, is someone who I think you could technically call him a socialist, if not more. I remember when Gerald Butts was reading Thomas Piketty's neo-communist book called Capital, the French economist with we're basically saying communism got a bad rap, let's just call it a different thing. And Gerald Butts was so taken with this, he was tweeting about how much he loved it and how right Piketty was. I thought, oh my God, that's the kind of economic advisor that Greece had or something. So you've got Bill Morneau on paper. I just hope Gerald Butts and inexperienced Justin Trudeau aren't calling the shots, but in our parliamentary system, they do. Well, we don't know precisely what the, the, the influence of, of different people uh, inside a cabinet and, and, and non-elected, but Gerald Butts obviously is a very important guy. Uh, Dominic LeBlanc is going to be very important in caucus as well, the House leader. But, you know, when you mention uh, Piketty, uh, of course, uh, Christia Freeland, uh, the new uh, Minister of International Trade, is a great, uh, a great advocate of that uh, book as well, as you know. Oh, my God. I'm nervous. I'm nervous, Joe, and I think that Canadians forgot what crisis was like because we steered over the last nine years through you know, choppy waters of the international Great Recession. Didn't hit us hard. We avoided so many of the problems. And I think Canadians said, oh, this must be easy. As Justin Trudeau says, budgets balance themselves. This is easy. And I think we are going to learn the hard way that it wasn't easy and that sloppy decisions can multiply. I think you've set the country on a trajectory. The sheer momentum will do well no matter what they do for the first while, but they can make some terrible decisions. What's the number one thing you're worried about? I asked you to say a kind word about your successor. Now tell me what the number one thing you're worried about that they might do wrong. Well, they've already said, it's, it's an integral part of their platform, that they're going to have substantial if not massive deficits they're talking about 10 billion dollars a year for a few years uh, and then it'll go down and then they hope the year before the election uh, that they're going to be in a surplus i mean my concern is that the deficits will get out of hand and uh, you know if you you look at their numbers they don't quite add up uh, so uh, it, it it does take discipline and uh, a plan to implement it you know, it just, <laughs> budgets don't balance themselves. I don't want to retread uh, the election, but that's, uh, you know, that is, that is a fact. So, uh, you know, my concern is that if you don't have the discipline of, of, of saying that you absolutely need a balanced budget, then if you're 10 billion over or 12 or 13 billion, or maybe it's 15 billion, it doesn't attract the same kind of public attention or political blowback uh, that it would if you if you said you were going to have a balanced budget and then you were 500 million behind. I mean that's all the difference in the world. And balanced budgets are really important. They mean you can spend more money on social programs, on health care. It means you can drive down taxes, which make the country more competitive. It means that you're not uh, weakened in the event of, of international crises. You can withstand them. And morally, it means you don't have to pass on your debt to your children and your grandchildren. Saddling our children with our debt is, is not the right thing to do. No family would want to do it. No country should either. Hmm. Joe, I got a question for you about the conservative movement now. I have a theory that for the last nine years, the, while the Conservative Party was strong, a minority government and then a majority government, any Conservative political goals 
instead of organizing on the ground, organizing an or, uh, a club or an NGO or a student society, people just called up Joe Oliver or Jason Kenney or Ron Ambrose or Peter McKay and dealt with the government directly. So we didn't build up what I call conservative uh, nonpartisan infrastructure. Whereas the left, because they were out of power for almost 10 years, they did. They built up public interest law firms and groups like Lead Now and, all, and almost 100 third party campaign groups, voter ID. They, because they didn't have access to the former levers of power, they built this infrastructure and now they've got both. They've got the parliament and they've got the law schools and the journalism schools and the popular culture. My theory is that the right doesn't need to focus on the Conservative Party right now. It's actually in fairly good shape. The right needs to build things like student clubs where it's okay to be conservative. We need to f have a pro-pipeline group like the 100 anti-pipeline groups. We need nonpartisan stuff that we neglected for nine years. What's your response to my theory? Well, I think you're right that we don't have as robust an intellectual conservative movement in Canada as they do in the United States. It's partly because, of course, they're much larger, but that's not the, the, the only reason for it. I mean, we have the Manning Institute. Preston Manning, I think, has been a, uh, a very important figure in, 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 in conservative philosophy and conservative uh, politics. Uh, we have the Fraser Institute, which is, you know, a small c, uh, very, very high quality uh, think tank. Uh, we have uh, we have the CD Howe, which I don't characterize as conservative, but it's it's a mainstream uh, center uh, of the political spectrum, uh, you know, thinking uh, group of, of people who are doing you know solid but there's no research. Action there's but, no, but, there's but, no street but, organizers right. and that's, tub thumpers and let's start a parade, you know. That's, that's correct. correct. And as we know, in the universities, it's uh, it, it reminds me of a of, of a uh, of a quote from. Uh, uh, John Diefenbaker, who said that to be a conservative, the only thing that saved you uh, as a conservative in, in, in Saskatchewan were the, uh, were the hunting licenses. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hazardous almost uh, to be a, a conservative at, uh, at university, and that's really unfortunate. You would think, first of all, universities should be open to, to freedom of speech and political discourse of, of every kind as long as it doesn't generate in, into, into uh, you know, hate. Uh, literature, yeah. uh, but um, it's uh, it, it's it's a function of the political orientation of uh, of our teachers at, at secondary school and our professors at university, and uh, there's a certain political correctness uh, which which appropriates to itself um, everything that's sort of mainstream and anything that uh, is a little bit uh, to to the right. Um, you know, is just sort of not acceptable, not even Canadian. That's unfortunate. And so we need uh, people with ideas, people with, with political and moral courage uh, to, uh, to help develop that kind of infrastructure you speak of. Last question, just a quick one. So what's next for Joe Oliver? You're environment, you're national resource minister, finance minister. You're still, you got pep, you got energy, you got a fight left in you. What are you going to do? Well, I have a lot of private sector, public sector experience, and I do have a lot of energy. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to take a vacation next week, uh, but I uh, have a number of opportunities I'm looking at. I want to stay engaged. I want to do things that are interesting and that will, uh, uh, will help the country, and I, uh, I hope I'll have that opportunity going forward. Well, that's great. Thanks for joining us on our premiere edition of the Ezra LeVant Show. It's great Congratulations again. Thanks very much. Stay with us more after these, uh, these quick words. We've heard you loud and clear. You can't get enough Canadian conservative news and opinion. Why not check out our blog? It's all your favorite conservative bloggers together on a page called The Megaphone. Go to the rebel.media slash The Megaphone or click on the Megaphone menu from our main page to check it out. Today I'm directing my administration to cut through the red tape break through the bureaucratic hurdles, and make this project a priority. So go ahead and get it done. That's U.S. President Barack Obama three years ago saying, let's get it done, let's build the pipeline. Well, not only did it not happen, but this interminable wait, this multi-year review and then review of reviews was finally rejected outright by President Barack Obama. Well, joining us now via Skype from South Carolina is the former U.S. ambassador to Canada, 
a great booster of the Keystone XL pipeline, our friend David Wilkins. Welcome back to the program, Ambassador Wilkins. We've talked many times at the Sun News Network. It's a pleasure to have you on the rebel.media. Are you, like me, disappointed, not just for Canada, but for America's sake, that the president seems to have chosen OPEC conflict oil from Venezuela instead of Canadian ethical oil that would have come through this pipe? Well, first of all, it's great to chat with you and great to, great to be back with you. And uh, it's, uh, always, I've always enjoyed our uh, previous chats in, uh, in the past. So uh, great to be here today and welcome from uh, sunny South Carolina. Um, but yes, uh, you, said, you already said it well. But like uh, most Canadians, uh, like most Americans, I was um, not surprised, uh, but certainly disappointed uh, by the... Uh, President's uh, ultimate uh, rejection after dragging this thing along for seven years, uh, his rejection of the KXL permit. I looked at the rejection and the wording of it was quite careful. The rejection did not say this pipeline would devastate the environment. It referred to a perception of oil sands oil. Like it didn't, it wasn't even a scientific or evidence based rejection. The actual written reasons that the State Department and the President issued were, well, the perception of, quote, dirty oil. So, I mean, even in the rejection, there was an admission that it wasn't an evidence-based move. Am I, am I reading that correctly? Well, it's, it's hard to, to interpret it. He says that, and yet he goes on to uh, basically reject it on the basis of the environment and uh, said it's not in the national interest of the United States. In my opinion, nothing could be further than the truth. I mean, uh, relying more heavily on Venezuela oil, and as you've already said, or uh, Iranian oil, uh, Iraqi oil, uh, is uh, is certainly not in the uh, best interest of the United States. And uh, you know, Canada just simply deserves to be treated better, uh, quite frankly. And uh, it's a real slap in the face. I think it affects the relationship, um, and uh, I think it's a huge mistake. It is the classic example. Trump and good policy. Uh, let, let me ask you about the relationship. I mean, Stephen Harper, the Prime Minister until last month, and Barack Obama clearly have different personalities, different histories. But despite all that, they managed to work together on important bilateral files uh, in the war on terror, in managing the border so goods and people could still travel. I mean, there's a lot more to the relationship, as everyone always says, than Keystone Excel. Can you help me understand why uh, the timing here? I mean, within a couple of weeks of Justin Trudeau taking office, and Trudeau always said, I'll be much smoother with Canada-U.S. relations. I'll be Mr. Suave, and I'll offer Barack Obama carbon taxes. Is, do you think that, how can you explain the timing? My theory is that in their first phone call, Justin Trudeau, told Barack Obama that Trudeau was going to pull out of our multinational coalition against ISIS. And I thought that was a dangerous thing to do to our number one friend and ally. Is that just speculation on my part? Do you think that this was a tit for tat by Barack Obama? Or do you think he thought, well, Stephen Harper's gone. Let me just rip off this bandage. Well, there's a lot of speculation about the timing. But I don't think there's any doubt that uh, he was going to... Uh, reject the pipeline at some point. If you, it, it's probably interesting if you look at the, the, the timetable on this thing, you know, it, this thing took seven years. That's twice as long as it took U.S. and Canada and allies to win World War II. Uh, it's almost four or five times longer than any other process, any other permitting process. But it, back in 2012, he delayed it to the, uh, just prior to his election when there was a big push to do it. Uh, and most people thought he would get reelected, then he would do it. And then, it, then we sort of gravitated into the 2004 terms, and he didn't do it because he felt, I believe, a lot of speculation, he felt like he would hurt the Democrats by doing it. And so he waits till then, and then, of course, then Canada's in, in an election, and uh, I, I think most probably that rather than do it, uh, doing the Canadian election and get accused of trying to meddle in the, connection, in the election, they waited until just after the election, but... You know, for a long time, I felt like they were going to. He was going to announce this rejection prior to the Paris uh, climate talks uh, coming up very soon, and uh, because he wanted to go to Paris with this uh, 
uh, you know, this mantle of uh, being a strong environmentalist and having the rejection of KXL as an example of that. Uh, so I, I, I never doubted that he would do it before the, the parish talks. So maybe he was just waiting so it didn't look like he was throwing a, a, a wrench or, or a, uh, it wasn't meddling in the election. That, that seems plausible to me. I got one last question for you, Ambassador Wilkins. One of the things we heard during the Canadian election, and I hear it a lot in the media, and yet I don't see any evidence for it, is that if Canada somehow promises to bring in carbon taxes or BTU taxes or cap and trade taxes on ourselves, that that will somehow grease the wheels for U.S.-Canada relations. I don't believe the United States has ever communicated that to Canada diplomatically. And I look at how the United States imports oil from every OPEC country, and they certainly don't have conditions based on carbon footprint. I look at how the United States does its trade with China, the biggest emitter of carbon dioxide and real pollution in the world. There's no conditions on it. I think this is a myth in Canada that we have brought this on ourselves by our bad behavior. Speaking as a former ambassador from the United States to Canada, is that just a Canadian conceit that this is about our domestic policy? Or has the United States ever said to Canada, if you jump through certain carbon hoops, you'll get things from us? What would you say to this, this hypothesis that's taken root in Canada? I think that's a smokescreen. Uh, I think that's a myth. Uh, I would respectfully say I think that argument borders on frivolity. It, uh, it, it never had anything to do with, uh, with Canada. This was all about American politics and U.S. policy, uh, US politics. And uh, the president wanted to leave office with a strong environmental legacy. And that's what this is about. Not about what Canada did or didn't do or could have done. If you look at all the countries we import oil from, Canada by and far, by, by, by a large margin, uh, has better rules, stronger regulations, more environmental regulations, uh, stronger human rights rules, uh, rule of law, uh, than all the countries basically combined that we import from. Uh, and so it's, it, you know, if you take that argument, uh, you almost, you ought to say, well, why don't we continue to get oil from Venezuela or get oil from uh, Saudi Arabia, other countries, and so they don't hold a candle to, to uh, the environmental record of Canada. So I, I just think that's a smokescreen for those that uh, are trying to come up with a reason why the U.S. did not treat its neighbor and supposedly best friend better than it did. Ambassador, you're a great American and a great friend of our country here in Canada. It's a pleasure to talk with you again, and thanks for joining us on our debut episode of the Ezra LeVant Show. Great to see you again. Thank you. I'm privileged to be, be the first one. Thank right you on. very much. Thank you. Stay with us. Uh, my final thoughts and your Twitter feedback coming right up after this. Looking for the perfect gift? Did you know the Rebel.media has a store? Make a statement with a t-shirt. Have your morning coffee in a Fearless Travel coffee mug. There's even an Ezra LeVant bobblehead. It's a one-stop shop for the perfect gift. And don't forget to pick up something for yourself. Go to therebel.media slash store to find out more. One of the ways we've set up the Rebel.media is to make it interactive, not just a one-way street where we talk and you listen. There's lots of ways you can interact with us too. Something as simple as our lively comment section under every story. Did you know that many Canadian news websites are completely doing away with comment sections? I think part of it is they don't like criticism of their stories and their slant. They don't like people calling them out on their pro-liberal or pro-Omar Carter or pro-global warming biases, or whatever else they lean to in the media party on that day. So that's just one example. We love our comments section, even critical comments. We draw the line at raw profanity or obscenity, but we love a great debate. Anyways, I like reading some of the feedback we get by email and on Twitter online. Here, let me share a few comments with you. These are tweets in the run-up to our big launch of the show today. The first one is from YYZ Jedi, who says... Thank God your show is back. We can't get the truth anywhere else, it seems. Hey, thanks for that. Of course, we don't have a monopoly on the truth, but we sure have a part of the truth, a part that I believe is obscured or deliberately ignored 
by the mainstream media. I never, people, I never tell people, stop reading other newspapers or stop watching even the CBC. I always say, come to us for the rest of the story, for the other side of the story. So thanks for your support. Here's Jim Finnegan. He tweeted, the power of the rebel is in forwards, shares, and retweets. Careful you don't have unintended consequences by locking down the site. I take your point. You're asking about the fact that we plan to eventually charge eight bucks a month for our daily hour-long TV shows. By the way, we're going to add other shows too. It's not just going to be me. Listen, I take your point. The Rebel has grown totally by people sharing and forwarding and Facebooking us. It's amazing. We now have more online traffic than, say, mclean's.ca, and it's all from sharing. And we'll never stop having tons of free, shareable stuff. Everything you have enjoyed in the past eight months will continue and continue to be free. I'll continue to do quick video hits every day, as I always have. And we're going to add more free stuff, too. But in two months or so, we plan to put these long-form shows behind a member's area, and we'll show short clips and trailers from it in the free area, too. But we do have to have a long-term revenue model. After all, unlike the CBC, Justin Trudeau isn't going to give us an extra 150 million bucks this year as a thank you for our election coverage. Here's Dave Vaughn. Keep up the great work, Mr. Ezra Levant. You have our support in Ottawa, 110%. How can we help? Well, thanks a million, Dave. Uh, well, the number one way to help us is to share us with friends. Spread the word. Unlike the CBC, we don't have huge budgets. We're not part of a massive corporation where we have radio stations and newspapers all cross-promoting us. It's just us. Us and you. So if you can help share us with friends, tell your friends about us, that's great. Facebook is the best way. Well, look, not everyone likes us. Let me read a bit of a hater. Here's Tina Brooks, who says, Anyone who can stomach Ezra Levant is scary. No, Tina, look, just because someone disagrees with you or you disagree with someone doesn't mean we're scary. That's the kind of demonization that the left prefers these days to debating their opponents. It's one step before the censorship instinct which I regret is on the ascent with this new liberal government. Well, that's the end of our first show. We're going to do it all over again tomorrow at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. I thought for a first effort, you know, I thought it was great. We had great guests. My thanks to Joe Oliver, the former Minister of Finance, for joining us. I enjoyed our conversation. And our old friend, Ambassador Wilkins, a great friend that Canada has in the United States. And most of all, thank you to you, our viewers, who built this amazing virtual studio and who watch us every day. We'll continue to do our best to live up to your expectations. For the Rebel.media, I'm Ezra Levant. See you tomorrow.